Quebec, December 31st, 1775. Night falls. Snow and wind lash the city in a blinding fury. But outside the walls, an army prepares to attack. These are the soldiers of the American Revolution. If they succeed, Canada will be part of the future United States. desperate American revolutionaries failed, of course, in their assault on Quebec. Their leaders had termed it a friendly invasion to accomplish by arms what they'd failed to do by persuasion. For Washington, Jefferson, and Franklin had felt it was important that Canada join the 13 rebellious colonies against Britain. Since then, almost two centuries have passed, and there are still two sovereign nations north of the Rio Grande. Almost a whole continent with only two countries. Not one country, not a dozen countries, but simply two. Yet two countries where most of the people speak the same language, look back to similar origins, and cherish similar institutions. Why did the United States, with ten times Canada's population, never swallow her up? The United States was always able to do it, and there were always some Americans who wanted to take over Canada. How then did Canada happen to survive? John F. Kennedy once said that history had joined the two countries. But some Canadian authorities claim that history is precisely what has kept them apart. What is very true is that the histories of the two countries have been profoundly interwoven. So what we're going to try to do here is answer that question, how did Canada happen to survive, by examining the fabric of both these histories together. It's an intricate, changing, and fascinating process which involves most of Canadian history and a large part of American. To start with, we have to go back almost 500 years. The navigator's lamp shining on the Western Atlantic. An age of discovery had started and old rivals among the nations of Europe were sending explorers westward to find new sources of wealth. If the world was round, this should be the way to the Orient, to China with all its riches. And so the little ships ventured onto the vast sea. But it was America they found, not China. And among the first of them was John Cabot, who planted the flag of England. It was the beginning of Britain's long interest in this part of the world, which was strengthened in 1583, when Humphrey Gilbert claimed outright possession of the Newfoundland fishing base, long used by ships of several nations. England's interest soon expanded. She was becoming more and more commerce-minded. And now she sent her explorers through the warmer waters to the south, probing the bays and river mouths of the American coastline. Here they found lands more attractive than the north. But they were not empty. There were Indians who seemed friendly and held out the promise of trade. But England had a rival in North America. The flag of France had been brought there by Jacques Cartier in 1534. But his path was a different one, for he had discovered the St. Lawrence River, a fantastic highway to the interior.
Jack Cartier followed the mighty river road for a thousand miles into the interior until he was able to stand atop Mount Royal at Montreal and gaze out at a vast domain unknown to the white man. It was sparsely populated by Indians who again seemed friendly. Eventually, England would have several holdings along the Atlantic coast. If ever linked up, they could control the front door to the continent. But the French, with one great thrust, had penetrated a thousand miles into the interior. From here, they were poised at the start of another 2,000 miles of inland waterways. Thus, through the back door, they might someday control the continent. The seeds of conflict had been planted. Who would be involved in the competition ahead? One group was now arriving in Massachusetts. In 1620, colonists from England determined to build a new life in a new world. They were deeply religious people, but their beliefs were not tolerated by the official religion of their homeland. Here in America, they could worship as they wished. And their leaders, men like John Eliot, brought the Bible and its message to the Indians, hoping to instill in them the precepts of a Christian life. For the Indians, the religious message might sometimes seem puzzling, but they sensed that some of the men who brought it had good intentions that seemed to promise a better world through harmony and agreement. Elizabeth I, Queen of England. It was under her reign that England had consolidated her mighty sea power, without which commercial expansion would not be possible. Dramatic proof of this power on the seas had come when Protestant England's fleet sank or scattered the huge armada of Catholic Spain. From her island base, England could now reach out across the seas to reap the benefit of her power. Business-minded leaders like Sir Walter Raleigh were already fascinated by the commercial possibilities, especially of the warmer parts of America, where they foresaw vast plantations of new products like tobacco, corn, and squash. They had visions of orderly farm communities where the Indians would work hand in hand with them in the pursuit of profit. And at first, the Englishmen found that the Indians were indeed willing to show them their secrets of how to enrich the soil, how best to cultivate the land, so that it would yield the new products. There were hardships, but the settlers kept coming. The restless, adventurous English nation had begun its endless trek overseas. In the 1630s alone, Thousands of them made their way across the Atlantic to find new homes in places like Jamestown, Virginia. Others moved off into the interior to open up new territory. But all too soon, they faced trouble with the Indians. For the Indian, the settler who was clearing the forest to build his own world, was destroying the Indian's world. The two ways of life came into bloody conflict. Far to the north, there were different perils for the adventurers from England. Here, icebergs and polar bears seemed to typify the discouraging quality of the land. But the sea was full of treasure, and it was profitable to come and take it. But in these natural harbors, the settlements were not permanent. They were seasonal, kept going only long enough to dry and cure the fish for the long voyage home.
this limited contact with the New World grew all through the second half of the 16th century. But even before this, Jacques Cartier of France, dreaming of diamonds and gold as he approached America, had discovered another good reason for setting foot on the continent. The Indians he found there were without the simplest of metal tools. For these, they showed themselves almost pitifully eager to trade. But it was far from Europe and the voyage was hard. What could the Indians possibly offer to make it worthwhile? The Indians did have something to offer from this desolate land. It was a small fur-bearing animal, the beaver. The fur of the beaver is thick and soft, and it has an unusual property. When matted, microscopic scales on each hair interlock to bind the mass into a firm and durable felt, ideal for the making of stylish hats. In 17th century Europe, these hats were all the rage among the fashionable rich. In Paris, the money to be made in beaver furs soon aroused interest at the French court, and Samuel de Champlain was commissioned to develop the trade. He was to follow in the footsteps of Jacques Cartier and make his way up the St. Lawrence River to cultivate the Indians. In 1608, Champlain established permanent headquarters at Quebec. From here, he set out on a great exploration to find Indians who would become hunters of furs and trade with him. For his backers, the whole enterprise depended on this. And here was the beginning of France's fateful penetration toward the heart of the continent. Champlain's canoe carried him up the Ottawa River, across Lake Huron, and back through much of what is now the province of Ontario. This route would serve missionaries as well as fur traders, for the French had also brought their religion with them. It was mainly among the Hurons that the Jesuit missionaries preached their zealous, crusading Catholicism. Their work could not help but have its effect on the fur trade, for the missionaries and the traders had one aim in common, securing the goodwill of the Indians. When the Indians responded favorably to the missionaries, the fur traders stood to benefit. And it worked the other way around as well. Religion and business cooperated, and furs from the Huron lands began to move steadily to Quebec. Indians, waterways, furs, trade, linked together in a harmonious pattern in French North America, a pattern very different from that of the English colonies to the south. In the English colonies, there was much bloodshed. Early hostilities between settlers and Indians had worsened into almost constant violence. Inevitably, the Indians were subdued, as the flow of settlers steadily increased during the 17th century. From harbors along the Atlantic coast, new colonies were being thrust inland, from Carolina in the south, all the way up to Massachusetts in the north. Year by year, English power was becoming more and more formidable. By contrast, in the north, in the French territories, the Indians fared better. For the French, the only good Indian was a live Indian, who could hunt animals and offer the furs in trade. There were settlers among the French, as well as fur traders, as ships arriving at Quebec brought sturdy farmers from Normandy and Picardy.
But there were far fewer French settlers than there were English to the south. Their colony was just a thin, straggling line of houses on the shores of the St. Lawrence River. The settlers were a deeply religious people, sharing with their leaders the dream of building an ideal Catholic society in the New World. They were also a gay people, fond of a good feast. Devout, life-loving, adventurous. This was New France, under the Fleur de Lys. As we have seen, the two societies growing up in the northeastern part of North America were very different, and they were headed for conflict. But why? With so much empty space on the continent, what reason was there to fight? Admittedly, one group was English, the other French. But on their own, differences in language and culture tend to keep people apart rather than bring them together in conflict. Admittedly, one group was Catholic and authoritarian, the other Protestant and individualistic. And they saw each other as papists or heretics. But even though religious sentiments were strongly felt, they alone were not enough to inspire a crusade in either direction. Another way in which the two groups differed was in their treatment of the Indians. The English colonists felt that the only good Indian was a dead Indian, but the French wanted their Indians very much alive for purposes of trade. But again, this difference wasn't enough to bring about a head-on collision. That leaves economic factors. But even here, the fur-hungry men of the interior and the land-hungry men of the coast seem to move in different orbits. What then would cause the eventual conflict? To find the answer, we must first look at problems arising among the Indians. The spires of Quebec and the Indian families camped around them seemed to symbolize a natural partnership between the white man and the red, one that preserved and even enriched the Indian way of life. But trade brought problems. The wonderful goods the French brought from Europe were soon no longer luxuries for the Indians, but necessities, avidly sought by all. Dealing in them was easier than hunting and very profitable for the middlemen. For wherever trade flows, middlemen arise. And before long, there were bloody wars among the Indians with the middleman role as prize. These trade wars were between old tribal enemies. Soon after they began, Champlain's guns helped his Algonquin friends score an easy victory over a startled band of Iroquois. From then on, the Iroquois, most powerful Indian nation in America, were the sworn enemies of the French. Just at this time, a second great river route to the interior was discovered, the Hudson Mohawk system and it ran, significantly, through the heart of the Iroquois country. The new river route was discovered by Henry Hudson, an Englishman, but he flew the flag of Holland, the country he was working for. The Iroquois at once saw that with the help of the Dutch traders, they could build a system to rival that of the Hurons and the French. A working alliance developed, and it was full of ominous possibilities for the colony on the St. Lawrence. The Iroquois warriors were armed by the Dutch, and they were ready to fight again to win for themselves the middleman role in the interior. Furs were drawn away from the St. Lawrence to the Dutch posts along the Hudson, and vicious conflicts broke out between the rival systems. Made bold by their victories, the Iroquois finally attacked the heart of the Huron country, north of the Great Lakes. The Iroquois virtually wiped out the Hurons, and the entire French trading network was torn to shreds. Among the victims of the Iroquois slaughter were the devoted French missionaries working among the Hurons.
By the middle of the 17th century, the Iroquois were attacking the outposts of New France itself. Despite heroic resistance, it seemed that the little colony would utterly perish. But help was on the way. An aroused France sent an able commander, the Marquis de Tracy, with professional soldiers to deal with the Iroquois. The Indians would not risk open battle against such power, and de Tracy finally forced them to withdraw by ruthlessly burning their crops and villages. For the moment, at least, the French colony was safe. Champlain had come close to the Hudson River, but had not discovered it. Some Canadian historians have regretted that France did not make up for this failure in exploration by seizing the river from the Dutch and making it part of her economic network. They argue that by not doing so, France condemned Canada to be forever weaker than the United States. There were at the time men in New France who advocated such a seizure. They felt that the Iroquois troubles showed that the Rumi continent was already too small for the rivals it had produced. They advocated pushing down the Hudson, seizing New Amsterdam, and even trying to encircle and expel the numerous New Englanders. But in France, there was doubt about undertaking such a big, uncertain venture, which would call for naval supremacy as well as a powerful army. And this at a time when New France itself was in dire straits. By the end of the Iroquois Wars, the vital flow of furs had entirely dried up. New sources had to be found. And so New France pushed westward once again, lured on by the marvelous network of waterways the fur traders kept discovering. The heroes of this great advance into the interior of the continent were the famous coureurs de bois. These men found no journey too long, no hardship too great, as they searched for more furs and new Indian partners. These alone could rebuild the commercial system of the St. Lawrence. Meanwhile, in the London of Charles II, powerful English commercial forces were at work, where there were men here who took the trouble to learn everything they could about North America. They knew the business end of the fur trade at first hand, and in their sales rooms they discussed the immense profits still to be made across the Atlantic. They were greatly interested in the possibilities of the Hudson, and while France was hesitating here, they were preparing to act. This came at a time when Holland was at the peak of its commercial power. In the North Sea, fierce Anglo-Dutch battles reflected the bitterness of the rivalry between the two countries. Across the ocean, New Amsterdam was a tempting target for the English. If they could seize it, the Hudson River route into the interior would be theirs. Moreover, they would be closing a dangerous gap between the existing English colonies to the north and to the south. And so the English set about harassing and intimidating the Dutch settlers. The Dutch were unable to defend their distant colony. And when a strong English naval force arrived at New Amsterdam, Governor Stuyvesant surrendered this important gateway to the continent. Meanwhile, in New France, the emphasis was changing. Colbert, the great French economic administrator, wanted to see the colony developed and strengthened. He felt that the straggling line of little farms was not enough, and that the utter dependence on the fur trade should be reduced. And so, new settlers were sent out. In a remarkably short time, the population doubled. But it was still only 7,000, less than one-tenth that of New England.
Experiments were made with new types of village organization to foster agriculture. As Colbert argued, the expansion of the colony should depend on what it could produce. Jean Talon, acting for Colbert in Canada, agreed that there should be more to the colony than just fur trade and farming. With this in view, he worked to create a variety of new occupations, encouraging local industry wherever it was practical. It was only a beginning, but there was a new air of optimism in the valley of the St. Lawrence. The little settlements of Three Rivers and Montreal were beginning to look more like towns. Perhaps there was some hope that New France might yet match the English colonies to the south. But Quebec's hope still depended on fur, and the old problems remained. A few years earlier, the French trader explorer Radisson had found an easily traveled water route to Hudson Bay. This was the third great gateway to the continent, and Radisson had a vision of new Indian partners and a cheap outlet for the fur trade. But Radisson was turned down by the war-weary authorities in New France, who felt the new route would involve yet more defense commitments. So Radisson took his plans to the British. In London, astute investors gave Radisson a warm welcome. They listened carefully to his enthusiastic descriptions of the country he had penetrated, to his statement that this was the richest storehouse of furs in North America. Prince Rupert himself was quick to see the possibilities of the scheme, and soon a charter was obtained, setting up a new trading organization, the Hudson's Bay Company. The company, which had the blessing of King Charles, was well organized and well financed. Before long, Radisson's dreams became reality when its ships arrived in Hudson Bay. From the bay, English lines of trade penetrated deep into the continent, establishing contacts with hunters. The precious furs, still the lifeblood of New France, were now being drained to English posts in the north, as well as down the Hudson River to the south. The struggling colony of the St. Lawrence was caught in an increasingly dangerous English pincer. By now, it was 1680, and New France faced a cruel dilemma. Early French commercial policy had made the little colony totally dependent on the fur trade. But this had meant dangerous expansion and involvement in Indian rivalries that had meant almost fatal wars. The small base on the St. Lawrence couldn't make its huge hinterland truly safe for traders and allied Indians. The brilliant but cautious Colbert had pushed a policy of strengthening the colony proper and had warned against overextension along routes hard to defend. But by caution, New France had missed two great opportunities, the Hudson River and the Hudson Bay routes. A dilemma indeed. Fur meant ever greater expansion, which needed a much stronger base than the fur men could provide. But too much concentration on the base meant lost opportunities in the contest for fur sources. And that trade was still vital. For New France still had a long way to go in achieving a more diversified economy. After Talon, immigration all but ceased. Independence from fur was still far off. So, when the full implications of the English successes became clear and furs began draining away to the north and to the south, the French were goaded into immediate action. The growing encirclement had to be broken. The only way was to expand, to push between the English positions. A new avenue had to be found. They found it in June 1673. They had sent the explorer Louis Joliet and the missionary Jacques Marquette to find a fabled river running south. 
It was the great Mississippi, leading to the Gulf of Mexico, and there were Indians aplenty here to trade with and to convert. Two years earlier, a representative of the French crown had stood at Sault Ste. Marie and proclaimed sovereignty over an enormous area that stretched far to the south and the west, taking in no less than half the present area of the continental United States. It remained only for La Salle to complete the exploration of the Mississippi to its mouth and to reaffirm the French claims on its banks. Amid the cathedral-like groves of the Mississippi, there arose in the minds of men like La Salle grandiose visions of an empire covering what are now half a dozen great American states. This French and Catholic empire would exist not only for fur trading and missionary work, but also for the greater glory and prosperity of France. And its spiritual center would be Quebec. The vision involved the rebuilding in a new world of the lost harmony of medieval times, of orderly villages where religion would be the center of human aspirations. This was the vision of a God-directed society. There would be a populace of ideal servants under ideal spiritual leaders, under men as able and determined as Bishop Laval who demanded a political as well as a spiritual role for religion in Canadian affairs. And with women as devoted as Marie de l'Incarnation, the first superior of the Ursuline nuns. The cross and the fleur de lis of France, symbols of the civilization that would radiate from the spires of old Quebec. But religion was only one part of New France's vision. Now, more than ever before, the other part involved wealth from the fur trade. For the new discoveries by the explorers had helped France regain the initiative. A French presence in the vast region formed by the basins of the Mississippi, Missouri, Ohio, and Illinois rivers would challenge the forces radiating from Hudson's Bay. And as for the English strongholds to the south, France had, in truth, outflanked them, but only just in time. Already the English tide was approaching the barriers of the Appalachian Mountains, and traders and adventurers were finding ways through. Inexorably, settlers would follow. French territorial claims implied that settlers should stay where they were, but would they? Consider how few French there were to control the huge area they claimed, only 10,000 as compared with the 100,000 Englishmen in the bordering colonies. Never was an empire so undermanned. But with seemingly inexhaustible courage and energy, the French struggled to tie together the St. Lawrence, the Mississippi, and the interior into a great commercial system. This was designed to encircle the powerful enemy and confine it to the coastal regions. On the Great Lakes and westward, the pace of trade was stepped up, and new efforts were made to keep the Indians peaceful. A remarkable new governor, Count Frontenac, met Iroquois leaders at Cataraqui in 1673 and lectured them on the virtues of cooperation and the awful consequences of war. For the moment, the Indians seemed convinced. But only 11 years later, the Iroquois signed an alliance with the English. Now these Iroquois, traditional enemies of the French, would have powerful backing if they went on the warpath. And they did go on the warpath, against the French and their Indian friends. These frightful massacres meant an end to the French hopes that they could neutralize the Iroquois. Meanwhile, up and down the Atlantic coast, ports of the English colonies were growing, and a great flood of efficiently produced British goods poured in. English rum, cheaper than French brandy, invaded French territory. 
Then, reinforcing bitterness in North America, came war in Europe. For it was 1689, beginning of the Second Hundred Years' War between England and France. As it progressed, their overseas empires would be increasingly involved. In Quebec, an angry Count Frontenac was back from France to take charge again. With the help of friendly Indians, he was determined to strike back against the Iroquois and the English. And he launched a series of raids of unparalleled ferocity against places like Schenectady, Deerfield, Casco, Wilkes-Barre, Falmouth. For the English colonists, the memory of these raids was to make the word Canada so synonymous with danger that for a century to come, there would be fear of any power to the north. But still, these were only guerrilla raids. The next phase would be formal clashes between the regular forces of France and Britain. Such warfare was urged by New Englanders like Samuel Vetch, who persuaded the British to send Sir William Phipps with a fleet to Quebec to order Frontenac to surrender. But Frontenac said, I shall answer you out of the mouths of my cannon. The English were driven from Quebec by the spirited French defense. And there was another victory for the French when Deberville swept the British out of Hudson Bay. But a British fleet took Acadia, and the French also suffered a series of disastrous reverses in Europe, like the great sea battle of La Hogue. New France was to pay for these defeats when the Treaty of Utrecht ended the war in 1713. Under the treaty, France surrendered all claims to Hudson Bay, one of the great gateways to the interior. She also had to give up any claims to the great fishing island of Newfoundland. And Acadia, twice previously captured and returned, now became Nova Scotia. But the treaty left some boundaries unresolved, and there were to be fluctuating claims to large border regions. The heart of France's North American empire had survived. But there was real satisfaction for New Englanders in the fact that Acadia and Newfoundland had finally been secured as British territory. There was peace, but the struggle continued. For the French, it meant new exploration, this time westward rather than south. The aim was to siphon off furs before they got to Hudson Bay and the English. The man who pushed the French route west was the remarkable La Verandrie, who went from the head of the Great Lakes, through Manitoba, and up to the Saskatchewan River, his sons went even farther, to the very foothills of the Rockies. Behind them arose a new chain of forts in competition with the English outpost to the north. Here were new focal points for tension, for fierce new conflicts between old rivals. This was the high watermark of France's brilliant North American adventure. This claim to the whole interior of the continent to an area half the size of the present United States. But France's lines of communication were overextended and vulnerable to outside pressures. The basic problem, an area too large, a population too small, foreshadowed problems that would long haunt the Canada of the future. For New France, it meant a diversion of energies needed to foster growth in the underdeveloped colony of the St. Lawrence. So instead of developing economic diversity, with the social changes this would have led to, New France remained largely agricultural, semi-feudal, and pious. The devout people along the St. Lawrence were living under a system that evolved very little as time went on. The relationship between the habitant farmers and the seigneurs retained an authoritarian tone, although it was far from being oppressive. But above all, the middle class was very small and lacked the vigorous business ambitions 
that could be seen in the English colonies nearby. Busy ports stretching from Massachusetts down the Atlantic coast to Florida reflected the commercial energies of the English colonies and presented a picture very different from that of New France. Here there were solid exports like tobacco to be sent overseas. And here was a rapidly expanding merchant middle class. The ships that crowded the harbors carried on a highly profitable trade between England, Africa, the West Indies, and the American colonies. West Indies sugar, African slaves, New England products like rum, and the cheap manufactures of Britain all flowed back and forth. A diversified economy in contrast to the fur trade, an economy that already led to cities with thriving business sections. The British colonies were outrunning New France in another way too where they kept attracting immigrants. These came not only from England, but also from other parts of Europe, like poverty-stricken Ireland and a Germany racked by war. By 1750, the English colonies had a population of a million, and many of them were pressing inland toward the vast territory of New France, with its population of only 70,000. It was a vanguard of traders, adventurers, and speculators that was surging through the mountains from the British colonies on the coast. They would be followed by men who would base their long-term livelihood not on furs, but on land. They wanted farms, which in time meant clearing the forests and driving out the fur-bearing animals and the Indians who hunted them. For the French, so dependent still on the fur trade, this threat to the source of supply was a new peril. But the French, in the aggressive spirit of the old fur trade, did not hesitate to react. There would be no backing down in the face of the oncoming English settlers. Instead, claims would be reinforced and protected by strong defenses. With brilliant military engineering, the French put up a long chain of defensive forts along the edges of their territory. They knew that their weakness lay in the small number of men available and their strength in mobile tactics and guerrilla warfare. From these forts, they would be able to harass the English and then retreat to strong positions when chased. Thus, the few sought to outflank and encircle the many with a great arc of fortifications that swept down from Fort Beausjour to Quebec and Fort Frontenac, through to Fort Duquesne and on to Louisiana a provocative encirclement, bound to arouse British resentment. Governor Dinwiddie of Virginia. The French faced formidable enemies in men like him and Governor Dongan of New York, both of whom had their eye on French territory. And there was Governor Shirley of Massachusetts, who feared France's naval threat, and Robert Rogers, who had become an expert in forest warfare. And finally, there was William Pepperell of Maine, who would lead the attack on the French fort at Louisbourg. Louisbourg was attacked in 1745 by Pepperell's New Englanders, transported by a British fleet. After six weeks of bombarding the fortress, Pepperell and his men were victorious, but Louisbourg would be in British hands for only a few years. Much to the disgust of the New Englanders, a treaty would soon return it to France. South of Louisbourg, more trouble was brewing. This was Nova Scotia, British since the Treaty of Utrecht, but the population was still largely French, the Acadians, who had stayed behind to till their prosperous farms. Their presence as a potential fifth column was a constant source of worry for men like Governor Shirley of Massachusetts. Partly at his urging, the city of Halifax was founded in 1749. It was hoped that here, a loyal population would counterbalance the potentially disloyal Acadians.
But the existence of Halifax was not enough to allay the fears of Governor Shirley and the other New Englanders. And in 1755, the Acadians heard the bitter news that they were to be deported from the area and scattered through other parts of North America. Few of the Acadians were actively disloyal, but they refused to take the oath of loyalty for fear they might have to do military service and fight fellow Frenchmen. This was Britain's reason for the deportation. The tragedy of the 10,000 uprooted Acadians showed how bitter the North American quarrel had become. To the south and west, English activity was beginning to spill over the Appalachian Mountains toward French territory, and British outposts like Fort Oswego stood threateningly close to the roots of the fur traders. Other colonial initiatives came with men like Colonel Robert Rogers, who with his Iroquois allies launched bloody forest raids against the French. Colonel George Washington, sent by the governor of Virginia in 1754 to expel the French from Fort Duquesne, key to the Ohio country. But the expedition failed, for Washington's men proved no match for the forest fighters from Canada. Washington's defeat shocked the British, and the following year, they sent a much larger force under General Braddock. But the formal array of British redcoats was heading into a trap. Colonel Beaujeu concealed his small band of French and Indian fighters in the forests they knew so well. Deadly fire rained on the British, who could barely see their enemies. 900 Anglo-Americans died, including Braddock himself. Here was full-scale war, although Britain and France were still nominally at peace. It was 1756, and the French had just seized Fort Oswego. War had been officially declared in Europe now, and in North America, the tempo of hostility was stepped up. At first, the French did surprisingly well, for they were still the masters of forest warfare. But the British destruction of Fort Frontenac in 1758 marked a turning point. Soon, Fort Duquesne fell too. By now, the British army was as large as the whole population of New France. Across the sea in London, new plans were afoot. William Pitt, the forceful new prime minister, agreed with young officers like James Wolfe that the French could be completely driven out of America by strong frontal attacks. Louisbourg, the stubborn fortress on the Atlantic, was the first target, and the method was an all-out amphibious attack. Louisbourg, the Gibraltar of North America, fought back stubbornly. But the bombardment by the British fleet and the landings of the army under Generals Wolfe and Amherst proved too much. After eight weeks, the British marched in, and Governor Shirley's dream was fulfilled. The following year, at Louisbourg, General Wolfe mustered his troops for the decisive assault of the war, an attack on Quebec itself. The army would be transported by Admiral Saunders and his fleet. Men like Saunders had made the British Navy master of the Atlantic with a series of brilliant victories over the French off the coasts of Europe and Africa. Now, the fleet was ready for Quebec. On board ship off Quebec, General Wolfe and his officers drank a toast to the success of his plan of attack. The fortress of New France seemed inaccessible, but early in the September dawn, Wolfe's soldiers set out on the river in small boats 
to carry out a daring scheme. The French expected Wolfe's attack at strongly defended places above and below his position on the river. But Wolfe had other plans. He had found a small trail leading to the heights of Quebec, a trail that was weakly guarded because it seemed useless. But for the Highlanders, it was the answer. Climbing up, it gave them access to the Plains of Abraham, and here they surprised the French. Hastily assembled, the French soldiers could not dislodge Wolfe's Highlanders. Wolfe died on the field, but his army swept on to victory. After winning the Plains of Abraham, they rushed on to capture the city, the very heart of Canada. A few weeks later, the British Navy drove the last of the great French fleets onto the rocks of Quiberon Bay. This victory in Europe destroyed France's last hope of rescuing her Canadian colony. Meanwhile, the French still held Montreal, but further resistance was useless. Rather than surrender their flags, they burned them. It was a bitter day for the defenders of New France when in 1760, Montreal yielded to Amherst's Anglo-American force. Louis XV of France, the proud Bourbon king, and his elegant fleur de lis had yielded everywhere to the red, white, and blue of Britain. Now the dominant world power under King George III, who had just been crowned. Captured French ships now flew the British flag, and it was supreme all over the northeastern part of North America. It flew securely at last in New England, now that the menace of New France had been removed. And it flew on the very St. Lawrence itself, key to the coveted interior. And Englishmen rejoiced. They saw simply that Britannia was at last victorious that the proud lion had sent the arrogant rooster a-running. Rich, ambitious, sophisticated France and her politicians were left to weep. And Jack Tarr might well smile at the French discomfort. For at his command, Mars and Neptune, gods of war and the sea, had miraculously joined forces and removed the French challenge to British North America. From the Ottawa to the Ohio, the spoils were enormous. A great swath of territory for the English settlers to colonize. A fabulous land of mountains and lonely lakes and rushing rivers. But it was a desolate and forbidding land. And in the minds of many Englishmen, it was far less desirable than other parts of the vanquished French Empire, like the little island of Guadeloupe in the West Indies. Here, rather than gloomy pine forests, there were friendly palm trees. And the island was incredibly rich. Guadeloupe was the greatest sugar-producing area in the world. Would it not be better in the peace settlement to take this gem of an island rather than the vast and empty expanse of French North America? This idea held much attraction in bustling mercantile England, whose greatness, as reflected in its busy docks, had been built on the cold calculation of profit and loss. So, in the British Parliament, debate. It was pointed out that Guadeloupe's exports were worth 600,000 pounds a year, 45 times the value of Canada's fur trade. So why take Canada? But it was William Pitt, the Prime Minister, who finally prevailed. France would recover, he said. Canada must remain a British base. 
Thus the map was formally redrawn in the Treaty of Paris. The year was 1763. And in Paris, the sky blazed with fireworks. After 75 years of intermittent war, there was now peace between England and France. In North America, every settlement from Hudson Bay to Florida now flew the Union Jack. For the New England colonists, the mother country had removed a hated obstacle in the path of expansion. As far as London was concerned, Canada would now be another Massachusetts or Connecticut. But Canada was clearly not like the others. It was French, with cultural roots as deep and as unique as any Anglo-Saxon colony. And there was something distinctive about the empire the men of the St. Lawrence had forged from the forest. No lack of vision or energy had beaten them, only numbers and isolation. Would the independence of the Canadian system reassert itself, or would it be absorbed in some grander continental system? Confidently, London prepared to organize her victory. But that very victory was to prove her undoing. 